Hello, dear friends. How are you? I'm Ari Ferger, and today I'm here to have a little chat with you concerning animism and asking for permission. Meaning, when dealing with entities of place, let's say other than human persons, from the point of view of animism, asking for permission is a sign of respect, but it is also a way to protect ourselves and a way to build a relationship with the entities of place. Asking for permission to enter habitats, environments, spaces. Too often we impose our presence in a space inhabited by all sorts of entities and we forget that just as a stranger coming into our house, our private space may not have the best of effects in our life and provoke all sorts of negative emotions, our presence too may not be welcomed in several areas that are not our home but are the home of the others. So, asking for permission is important. Let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, here in this channel, October uh, has always been a month to talk about themes related to witchcraft and magic, but this video is a little bit different. I think it is an important subject we should definitely discuss, so please share your experiences, knowledge and insight concerning this subject in the comments below, if you please. Besides, uh, this video is a development on a little video I've done at my Instagram and uh, many were the comments asking for or to elaborate on this. So here we go. In fact, uh, let me show you what I have said concerning this, if you please. Hello everyone, how are you? I'm here contemplating uh, a waterfall I'm going to show you. And as I was in here um, looking at the landscape, it struck me that nowadays, mostly in European neo-paganism, uh, I've come to realize that a lot of people never talk about asking for permission when we enter in these environments, in these natural environments. Um, usually people go into a specific place and take a rock, a piece of bone, uh, a stick, something, or dive into the water, and they never ask for anything. They never ask permission to the local spirits, to the water spirits, the, the more than human and other than human persons. And while we look at uh, indigenous animism, especially from Brazil and uh, Australia, uh, people always ask for permission to enter in specific environments, in specific places, and even to dive into the water. Uh, indigenous peoples ask permission to the um, water spirits, uh, whatever, uh, several entities uh, of the water, they ask for permission <laughs> to enter in those environments. And we, in um, neo-paganism, mostly we Europeans, never ask for anything. <laughs> we just dive into the water or take something, and it's... That sort of thing just struck me now because I'm about to probably <laughs> at least wet my feet a little and uh, I was thinking about that we, we never ask for permission to do anything and um, that's the sort of the basics to create a healthy relationship with the local entities uh, maybe I will do a video about this I don't know but I, I thought it was it is a curious thing that we uh, neo-pagans, especially of the so-called Western society, we still have this very colonial uh, mentality, right? We just arrive into a place and everything is ours. We just take and use and uh, walk about and <laughs> we never ask for anything. And that's, that's pretty awful. From the, the point of view of animism and from the point of view of, these, of, of creating these relationships with uh, all sorts of entities of these natural places, we still have this colonial mentality and, <laughs> and that is pretty horrible and I think we should really ponder about that, we should really think about that, about the, how we behave and how we interact with the local environments and this, I mean this, it's not just a basic need but it's this sort of humbleness before nature and before everything else that lives in here and we are entering 
they are habitats and we never ask for anything. We never ask permission and I think that should be something to think about and something we should definitely do. That's it. <laughs> it's just an idea that's just struck me right now. Anyway, I'll see you around. <laughs> In our societies and in our perception of the world and how we engage with it and its persons, well, there's often the tendency to have a dualistic view of things and that's all right and normal. Duality is present in many things. And although animism is a broader perception and expression of human engagement with its surroundings and persons, and uh, well, certainly dealing with a far more engrossing multiplicity of realities and the diversity of identities, animism also has some dualistic mind frames. However, it's seldom a question of good and evil, light and dark, life and death, and that kind of dualistic mentality. But rather, in animism, it's less about opposites and more about compatibility. For instance, Within animistic communities, uh, there's often the effort to break hierarchical structures and instead promote a network of interactions that are much more associational. It's more about collaboration rather than forming opposites. Rather than interactions that place persons over others or below them, it's about intertwining relations with persons for a greater benefit of the whole. Rather than good and evil, let's say it's creation and destruction, right? Rather than a positive view on light and a negative view on darkness, light and darkness complement themselves and one cannot exist without the other. The sacred and the profane are not opposites and one is not detached from the other, but everything is sacred and profane. There's no separation. What may seem profane to some is sacred to others and vice versa. The ancestors are not so different from the descendants. They all live in cycles of existence and what has come will come again. There's really no hierarchical structure between the living and the dead. Birth is not opposed to death. One cannot exist without the other and it's a continuous transcendence. Animism tries to bring together what may seem opposites, but really aren't. We could say a friend is the opposite of an enemy, surely. But these pairs can be brought together because creating relationships is never easy and it, it certainly isn't something static or meant to last forever. We work on our relationships, we nurture them. A friend can become an enemy, just as an animal enemy can become a friend. A stranger is a stranger and we can create a friendly relationship with the stranger or not. But there is choice and the choice must be given to this stranger, either to behave in a way that leads the stranger to become an enemy or giving the choice of action and behavior for the stranger to engage in a more cooperative relationship in which the stranger becomes the friend order and chaos. One isn't better or worse and one does not reject or opposes the other, but each exists in the other. All things that may seem opposites have a participation and are included within the community and in the wider community of life, allowing all manner of possibilities to happen. If we deny some aspect of life or a person's position in society just because it feels like something opposed to what we like or accept, we are breaking, or rather, we are denying potential and by denying participation, we also deny all sorts of possibilities, including the ones that can be to our benefit, which are the relationships of collaboration. The stranger has a choice and that choice must be allowed. The stranger must be allowed to engage and participate. Permission must be granted. But just as permission exists, there's also restriction, which doesn't have to be an opposite, but a mutable condition 
that, for a time, must exist in order to prevent less beneficial or even harmful outcomes, to preserve permission itself. For a beneficial relationship to be established and nourished, it is fundamental to understand permission and restriction, especially concerning a community's culture, ways of life, language, taboos, moments of sacredness, places that are sacred, places and behaviors that are forbidden for a determined amount of time, and so on and so forth. This is a sign of respect to understand, to honor and to recognize and take into consideration the ways of life of a community. Now, just as a community of human persons has its own culture and traditions, as well as its members and each individuality is in a cooperative relationship with the whole community of human persons, other communities of beings also have their own ways of life, their own spaces, their own laws, their traditions, languages, their own restrictions. If communities of other than human persons have restrictions, they also have the ability to give permission. Restriction cannot be forever because it does not allow evolution and the evolution of spaces and the evolution of life comes precisely through engagement and creation of cooperative relations. Restriction can generate animities through acts of force, creating opposition instead of collaboration. This is stagnation. Things must be allowed to flow in their natural course. Lives must be allowed to live and flow. Restriction is more to do with preservation, but preservation isn't possible if engagement isn't allowed. Engagement promotes understanding. Understanding gives knowledge. Knowledge gives respect. And this respect from the part of strangers that become friends is fundamental for the preservation of cycles and the natural course of things. The world is full of persons. It is absolutely populated with persons, many of which are not human. We engage with all sorts of persons with whom and towards whom we make choices and we perform some behavior or some form of expression to create relationships. These relationships can be beneficial or harmful, but with a full consciousness towards the need and the, the, the desire to maintain the cycles and the natural course of things, in animism we try to engage in a way that will create as much as possible a relationship of cooperation for the benefit of the whole including to our own benefit, because we all share habitats with all sorts of persons. And so, just as the same way a human community has restrictions, but, he, but is also capable of giving permission, other communities of other persons do the same. By entering their habitat without asking permission, even if permission could even be something already established, it is a sign of disrespect. There must be this attitude of humbleness, respect, esteem, consideration, recognition to show that the stranger, we, when entering someone else's habitat, is open, is willing to engage in a beneficial relationship. The choice is given. We either act as if everything was ours and we own the place or we engage in a way towards respect and recognition of the other and its community and natural spaces of existence. This is common sense because you are allowing the other to give consent. You are allowing the other to also have that choice instead of starting off immediately by expressing that the choice of consent isn't allowed by allowing the other the freedom of choice of choosing to give you permission or not you give a sign of respect and you may not have permission right now but at least you have shown the type of person that you are a person capable of respecting the existence and freedom of the other especially in their own home 
as such, you may be given permission at some point because by behaving in this way, you are also giving that community the time they need to choose amongst themselves if you are permitted and when you are permitted. As I was saying on that short video for Instagram, looking at indigenous peoples and societies and communities, we often see the curious behavior of asking permission to enter in a specific area, to enter or dive in into a river, some specific part of the forest, whatever place, ambience and environment it is known to be inhabited by particular entities. It is their home and as strangers to these communities of the others, indigenous peoples ask permission to enter or to cross. This behavior becomes customary, but in large, it seems it has been forgotten in the collective consciousness of the so-called Western society. I don't like to say Western society, but it's just for a better understanding. You know exactly what I'm referring to. And uh, further ahead, I will tell you why I don't like to use that term. But anyway, <laughs> from our part, persons of the so-called Western society, most of us just barge in into a specific natural environment, like we own the place and we can just walk about. Where does this arrogance come from? Where does this egocentric, narcissistic behavior originated from? Well, we could certainly blame it on religions such as Christianity and other similar belief systems, which places the human person not only as the center of all things, but the primary subject of some divine creation and stands as the beacon of divine will and power. Genesis chapter 1 verse, uh, verse 27 <laughs> So God created mankind in his own image <laughs> The human being seen as the most important element of creation and everything else deemed to be of less value Hierarchy instead of collaboration But we are quick to blame the very things that immediately and more concretely hurt us which is understandable of course But if we look past that religion in general has been quite the useful tool of a colonial mode of thinking. Christianity and such other similar religions and belief systems were, are, a tool of colonization. Therein lies the problem, colonialism. And I'm not just talking about the absolutely destructive colonial mechanisms of the great European empires of the modern period, but always looking further into the past we see societies that we would immediately label pagan to have the exact same conduct. Religion is a tool, but the core of the problem is colonialism. And if we are to understand animism and to understand the land as being populated by persons, many of which are not human, and of course, if we are also to help indigenous peoples thriving and growing out of the traumas and all the social and uh, generational negativity colonialism is still causing them, we, non-indigenous persons, we must also decolonize ourselves and deconstruct our perception in order to destroy our colonial or colonizer syndrome, which still comes in many subtle forms. We don't ask permission to enter a specific area because we still have this very colonizer syndrome of just walking about as if everything is ours because there's an perhaps unwilling unconscious and automatic lack of respect for the lives communities and everything else that isn't us or from our own perception of reality this lack of respect comes from the colonial mentality of ignoring everything that goes beyond our little bubble of self-aggrandizement through subjugation of lives and as much as many of us don't want to be that way sometimes it comes naturally without thinking because the colonial mode is still deeply ingrained in the very structure of our societies we i myself included sometimes a colonial behavior just comes out naturally 
even being racist in a subtle way that we don't even notice. Until we notice the pattern and start to interiorize how frightening it is to understand that many of our behaviors and actions upon this world comes from the colonial syndrome or colonizer syndrome. And we have reached a point where the world is absolutely saturated and dying because of our selfish desires as persons who have a horrible predisposition to exploit and enslave land and living beings. While I was looking at that river in, in the video and the idea of indigenous peoples asking permission to enter a river, asking permission to the local entities and the entities of the river itself, it struck me. And I've realized that I don't ask permission to enter a river. I don't like to hold on to labels, but just for a better understanding, I, as a pagan in a more animistic path, that's too, too specific for my liking, but anyway. Why do I ask permission to take a rock, a piece of wood or bone or to cut a flower, but I don't ask permission to enter in a specific part of the forest or even to enter or cross a river? I think the answer lies in the deep effects of a colonial perception of failing to perceive that it's not just a landscape, but it is a world absolutely populated by persons and the river isn't just a river, but contains a whole set of entities that in there inhabit. There's still subtle behavioral patterns that are the impulsive and nigh unconscious mechanisms of the colonial syndrome or the colonizer syndrome, which sees land as an area to be exploited, disregarding its persons. These subtle behaviors and ways of thinking are everywhere. And this is the reason why I don't like to say Western society, because that is a colonial perspective, as if the world was a flat map, <laughs> and from a Eurocentric point of view, and such point of view soaked and saturated in the post-Columbian societies, the world is divided into the West as being ours of Europeans and Euro descendants, and everything else isn't the West. But the world is a, a floating, slightly spheric rock rotating on itself all the time in the universe. There's no West. The same thing as modern countries and the illusionary lines we place on a map, which we call borders, and we assign meaning to them. But they don't virtually exist and have been changing all the time. It's just this colonial perception of owning land and its persons. And as much as we, modern pagans and animists of the so-called Western society, like to think we don't have such behaviors because we are pagans and more than anyone else we respect nature, we still have these behaviors, including not asking permission to enter natural places that aren't ours. And when I say pagans, modern pagans, Obviously, there's people who ask permission to enter natural environments, ask permission to take something and um, living offerings and such. But it's a minority. However, we must remember that modern paganism, neo-paganism, not only originated from an Eurocentric perspective, still deeply imbued in a Christian worldview, but also the predisposition to behave in a colonial manner. For instance, there Obviously, there has certainly been a progressive development of neo-paganism towards respecting the earth, respect the world and nature, which is good, it is fantastic, and, and even uh, behave in a way that is more respectful towards the land, like asking permission to take or do certain things within the land. However, it's not just asking the land, but also asking its inhabitants. The very basic original and central perception of neo-paganism of seeing the earth as a goddess is a shift from one monotheistic perception to another. The divine as a whole becomes the earth, so a neo-pagan approach to the land becomes this monotheistic behavioral pattern and focusing on the divine as an entity embodied as the earth switches the focus away from the individual and collective communities of living beings and other persons 
who couldn't care less about our own religious and spiritual beliefs. I mean, we must remind ourselves that our perception of the world and the perception of the sacred isn't the same as others' perceptions. If we are strangers in a particular habitat, we must ask permission to enter, cross over, walk about, do ritual, take or leave something. It's not just towards the land, but also understanding that the land is absolutely populated by many persons and they are in there. Every expression towards the divine as the earth is a selfish expression if we don't take into consideration all the other beings that inhabit all across the very land we want to honor, venerate and engage with. By creating relationships of mutual respect with the persons of a place, we are not only engaging with them, but also with the land itself, because the land itself is formed by all these persons and such persons in their own modes of life are the very elements that promote evolution of the land itself and promote the continuation of cycles. <laughs> if you remember the, the videos I've done concerning the first Icelandic settlers, where I've specifically and purposely said that Scandinavians colonized Iceland, some people, some of you, didn't like the word colonizing because in their modern perception it was not colonization because the land was not inhabited by other humans and there my dear friends therein lies the problem once again <laughs> taking into consideration that the scandinavians of the 9th and 10th centuries still had a largely animistic view of the world that surrounded them they did believe that the land was populated by many persons, many of which the ones we labeled the unseen or invisible others. The settlement of Iceland was colonization in the perspective or in the perceptive reality of these Nordic peoples of the time, because they were not entering a land devoid of persons. Surely humans were probably not there, but the land had its own fauna and flora and its populations of invisible others which the first Icelanders respected according to the literary sources, to, 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 to the sagas and written testimonies. Even to this day, the belief in elves, trolls, land spirits and a whole set of native persons that inhabit the land and their habitats are respected. The first settlers threw out of their ships the Onvegisurur, the high seat pillars the wooden posts carved with the images of the old gods and waited for the pillars to wash ashore, letting both the god Thur, Thor, the thunder person, and the local land spirits to decide where to take the pillars. And, and wherever they washed ashore, the settlers would construct their new home, the first settlement. This right there is a sign of respect and recognition of the other, and not only does this pattern demonstrate asking for permission, it also opens up the freedom of choice from the part of the invisible others who inhabit the land, taking the Hönvegisur to a place they deem to be the correct one for the strangers, the human strangers, to settle. Thus, strangers choosing to engage with the persons of a place, becoming friends and creating a cooperative relationship in the new land. Iceland. That's an example. Um, and answering Clara or Claire, uh, my deepest apologies if I don't remember your name or, or the name you use on Instagram. It's, it's a lot of people, I'm sorry. Well, she asks, how do we ask for permission and how do we know permission is granted? <laughs> my girl here asking the right questions. It eventually comes down to that, isn't it? But first, we do need to decolonize ourselves if we do want to have a far more animistic approach with the land that surrounds us. Every time we want to engage with a specific natural environment, we must not forget the invisible populations, or rather the persons which in their own existence do not have a form and color that enters in the perceptive reality of human senses. 
but they are in there nonetheless. Signs of permission, and if permission has been granted, that's up to you to discover. My own engagement and my own experiences are limited to myself alone and my own approach and the way I have sensed and or perceived things. Each person has their own methods that, that better suits them under their own condition and knowledge and experiential modes of life. Engage with the land and engage with the land with respect. All it requires first is basic decency, being polite, being courteous, empathy, empathy, right? Everything else comes in time. Be patient. And I know uh, we have the tendency to be rather hasty because we live in an absolutely materialistic society, a disposable society in which we quickly obtain something and when we no longer have use for it, we throw it all away and buy some more. But out there, that's not the human society. Well, because sadly, we have detached ourselves from the natural cycles and we have colonized places and we have shut ourselves in where nature has little space available to grow and thrive. But out there, when asking for permission, don't behave like a materialistic, capitalistic colonizer human being. Become the land. Engage as a person of the world and not a person of a specific society with limited and illusionary perceptions of identity confined to lines on a map. Become the other. In time and with patience, everything starts to pop up. And when you know, you know. <laughs> anyway, hopefully this video will have its positive outcomes. I do hope it helps. And please uh, do share your thoughts and insight and your own experiences. Many of us, I included, obviously, will certainly benefit from that knowledge. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thank you for today. Until we meet again, my dear friends.